Hello, this is Georgina Rose, part-time esoteric content creator and part-time center of pestilence, and welcome back to the Dot Darling YouTube channel. On this channel, we discuss a few things. We discuss magic, mysticism, religion, the occult, and everything on the fringe of esoterica. This is also the channel that hosts the cultural commentary podcast, The Postmodern Iconic Class, but this is not that. This is a YouTube video. And in this video, we're going to be talking about a term that's been floating around a lot that I've seen used as a buzzword, but I haven't seen many people explore it or sort of look into, wait, where did that come from? And that would be the term, the dark divine feminine. So I started hearing the term, the dark divine feminine on the internet, mostly on TikTok with these videos where people, you know, they'll get in front of the camera and they'll be like, mantras to connect to the dark divine feminine, right? And at first I was kind of like, yeah, this looks like a new buzzword, right? This seemed very new age, which for those who don't know, the new age movement is a particular movement. It has a history to it, which I'll explain very briefly. Basically the new age movement exists because of theosophy. Theosophy was one of these movements that emerged during the Victorian occult revival, which is the period um, where the occult really kicked off again, where the Golden Dawn, where Thelema, where all these things come from. And there was one group called Theosophy. Theosophy was the first group to bridge Eastern mysticism with Western mysticism. Of course, it had been done in small places here and there, but when we look at modern spirituality having that really strong like Buddhist and Hindu influence, modern is in mainstream modern, by the way, we're talking about theosophy. So theosophy is not what the New Age is, theosophy is where the New Age began. So basically, after theosophy, there was a student named Alice Bailey, who is controversial for reasons that I'm not going to get into, do your own research. And she started taking these teachings and really taught them slightly differently. There also is Rudolf Steiner, who was another person who broke off theosophy. And all these people kind of led to what is the New Age movement. And then in the 1970s, when there was the sort of hippie age, the psychedelic age, all of that stuff, it really kicked off again and became even more syncretized. And then we get the modern New Age. That does not look identical to what theosophy is. Not saying that. I wouldn't even consider theosophy New Age. I would just say it is where it originates. And so I thought this dark divine feminine thing was a New Age thing. However, the divine feminine is not a new age idea. It exists in almost every religion and culture in the world, right? Femininity is revered and understood for different religious reasons in countless traditions. In Christianity, femininity is a very specific place. Um, Mary, for instance, is central, particularly to Catholic and Orthodox denominations, with her even being called the Theotokos by the Orthodox, and her being seen as a critical part of those mysteries, and that leading to specific roles and ideas about women throughout the faith. However, the Christian idea of the Divine Feminine is not the only one. In Judaism, there is the Shekinah. As well, if you're looking at the Jewish mystical system, the Kabbalah, the Divine Feminine, is brought up a lot. Uh, in the Tree of Life, which is sort of the chart that Kabbalists use to map the universe, which Kabbalah is not just a Jewish thing. Kabbalah was later adapted by the Christians and then by the Hermeticists and then by most all modern occultists to the point where modern Kabbalah and Jewish Kabbalah look really different. But of course, that is the root of it. That is the origin. Uh, there is the Tree of Life where there's the Pillar of Mercy, which represents the masculine and the Pillar of Severity, which represents the feminine. And these two pillars coming together produce the equilibrium and eventually produces the material plane because the material plane is represented by Malkut, which is in the middle pillar. So the Divine Feminine plays a key role in that tradition as well. Furthermore, if you look into modern Wicca, the neo-pagan movement that is pretty much the gateway drug for everyone getting into occultism, or not everyone, most people, uh, you'd notice that there is a duotheism. So obviously monotheism means there is one god, right? But duotheism means there are two. And in Wicca, it is expressed as the god and the goddess, with the god representing masculinity and the goddess representing femininity and them coming together in most Wiccan rituals, sometimes literally and sometimes much more metaphorically, with imagery like the chalice and the athame bringing together to create magic. Uh, in Thelema, the divine feminine is also very present, with Nuit, Babylon being key roles in Thelemic mysticism and having a huge, huge part of the Thelemic understanding of the world. So obviously the divine feminine matters. There is no religion where it is not important. And of course, across religions, it varies a little bit. Um, like we, we typically associate the moon with femininity and the sun with masculinity. However, there were some particularly European pagan cultures that flipped that. So, you know, there's always variances, but generally they mean similar things across culture. There are overlaps. 
I personally sympathize a lot with this idea of perennialism, which is a philosophic stance held by a lot of people, uh, most famously Huxley, who is also a writer, that basically all religions and all spiritual traditions are from us trying to understand the same mystical experiences. At the core of everything, at the center of it all, there is one truth, one perennial tradition that permeates. And then through our own mystic understandings, expressions, and explorations, we tap into this and from that we develop religions. And so all the religions of the world are people experiencing the same mystic core and then sort of interpreting it in their own way. Kind of the idea that there are multiple paths up the mountain, as some people would say. So I sympathize with that. And so that's why I think this femininity thing comes up so much. Even in our secular culture, femininity is used as a term a lot. Um, it comes up constantly. And so I was thinking, what would a dark femininity be? Because we have these very specific associations with femininity in the West, right? We think of femininity as nurturing. We think of it as intuitive. We think of it as matronly. We think of it as beautiful, as soft. But I sat there thinking and I was like, that's really not all of what femininity is. I personally really value femininity. I think women connecting to their femininity is powerful. And I think that would include what some people call the dark divine feminine. So let's talk about the terms dark and light, because I think within religion, they have a very specific meaning and a connotation that's a little bit different that I want to talk about. So the connotation of dark and light is like good versus evil, right? And certainly sometimes it's used that way. I mean, we've seen the terms white and black magic, which have fallen out of use contemporarily, but were used a lot historically, right? Um, and when we look at black magic, black magic was magic used for personal gain or magic used for what is the term maleficia, with maleficia being the sort of historic term for dark magic, right? And then light stuff, we're like, oh, that's healing. That's benefic, right? But is that really what it is? Because when you look even at the benefics, right? The benefics in astrology, that would be, you know, the sun. That would be Jupiter. These things are supposed to be good, light, right? Because they're benefic, right? Whereas the malefics, Saturn and Mars, are obviously, if that's that, they're dark, they're evil. But that's not even true because even these benefic planets in astrology have, you know, ways that can be expressed negatively, right? They can be expressed in ways that are toxic, that are bad, right? Like if you're out in the sun, if you're out in the sun a little bit, you get your vitamin D, you're healthy, but if you're out in the sun for too long, you get burnt. And these malefics on the other side also have benefic nature to them, right? Like Mars is obviously aggression, it's war, it's sex, it's that raw masculinity that we think of when we think of masculinity, right? But what else is Mars? Mars is the strength to defend ourselves, to stand up for ourselves, energy, motivation. Saturn, of course, Saturn is discipline, it's boundaries, it's restriction, it's harsh, it's cold. But at the same time, Saturn gives us limits. Saturn allows us to assert our, our boundaries, to stand up for ourselves in a slightly different way, and to make our lives, you know, orderly, controlled, functioning properly, truly. And so when we look at what might be this dark feminine, this malefic feminine, we have to wonder, does that mean it's bad? And I would say no. There's this very specific prayer from the pagan book of prayer. It's in the section of prayers of praise. And what it is, is it's a prayer to the goddess, right? The book was written by a Wiccan, though the prayers extend far beyond Wicca. And the prayer, it goes through the sort of typical things you associate with the divine feminine, right? The bringing you in and out of the world, right? The the person who helps people cross, you know, places, that liminality, that intuition, those very lunar qualities. But towards the end, it says this line about a lioness protecting her cubs. And in a sense, people may gutturally go, that would be masculine because it's strength. But I would say no, because the lioness defending her cubs, that is still a femininity. That is still expressing that. As well, when I look into these entities that people are listing as associated with the dark divine feminine, they are feminine entities. They are goddesses. People are listing um, Kali, which obviously is a little complicated because Kali is Hindu, not European pagan. So I'm not gonna really explore Kali in super depth because I'm not the most versed on Hinduism. Um, ask someone else about that. It's just not my area of expertise. But the other ones listen to are Hakate. Let's talk about Hakate. Hakate is a goddess. She's actually a titan if you get into Greek mythology, right? 
and she represents witchcraft, which is why she's so popular and brought up a lot, but she also represents some other things. She is very chthonic. She's a psychopomp. She's liminal. She crosses between the worlds. She represents outsiders, but she's still feminine. She is still a goddess. And interestingly enough, she is still a lunar correspondence, right? Lunar stuff, though lunar stuff is attributed to the masculine in certain European practices, generally it's attributed to the feminine, so I'm going to generalize. Even the phases of the moon go through a light feminine and dark feminine cycle, right? We have the full moon, which is the one that people immediately think of, right? It's associated with those classic lunar deities like Selene, but then it goes through its cycle and becomes the new moon, even the dark moon. If you want to get really, really technical, people will say the dark moon is the first day of the new moon, and then the new moon is like the next day when it starts to return, right? So the new moon is when it's new and beginning to like grow again, basically. And that is still feminine. The new moon is very much viewed as mysterious, dark. When you're doing rituals, you do different rituals on the new moon versus the full moon, and this reflects that cycle. And so is the new moon sort of a representation of the dark feminine, it very well could be. So now let's explore some archetypes of the dark divine feminine, because when we talk about divine femininity and divine masculinity, archetypes come up a lot. A lot of the texts that are explicitly written about the divine masculine and divine feminine that are not tradition specific are archetype based. Uh, Women Who Run With The Wolves is obviously like the big one. Uh, that book is incredible. I really, really like it. But let's view those archetypes because archetypes are really important to this understanding. So I think the first one is the sensual feminine, right? This is kind of the thing that I think most people are talking about when they talk about the divine feminine because obviously Hakasa comes up, but you see entities like Lilith come up, which Lilith is a can of worms. Personally, I have no desire to do anything with Lilith. I don't. Not for like the weird cultural sensitivity reasons that some people get into, but just because I have no desire to bring that energy into my life. But she does represent a very specific archetype, right? She is this dark, feral feminine. Though, of course, when we look at Lilith, I think we need to have a short aside. So, Lilith. When people talk about Lilith, it gets a little tricky because the Lilith that people are used to talking about is the Lilith that is girl boss, feminist icon Lilith, right? I don't know if we could call her a feminist icon, but you know what I mean. Girl boss Lilith. We're just going to call her that. We're not going to get into the feminism can of worms. It's a different conversation, but girl boss Lilith, right? People get that from this story called the Alphabet of Ben Sirah, which is not the Torah. It is not the Talmud. It's the Alphabet of Ben Sirah. She is not exactly that in the Torah. If you look into classic Jewish mysticism, she is pretty much a screech owl demon who eats babies, right? But with the alphabet of Ben Sirra, she became this sort of girl boss figure who rejected Adam and became queen of the demons, right? And so now I have a little theory, a little conspiracy theory that a couple friends of mine agree with me on is that there are basically like two Lilith entities and depending on what you're doing, you're working with one or the other and they're just basically not the same spirit. I personally am a modest, which means that I believe all these entities and all of it is one emanation and they're different faces of the thing. So I think it's very possible to say that the two Liliths are faces of the same thing, right? They are different though. So I just want to put that out there. Though of course that's my theory. There are going to be people who disagree with me and I'm sure there's going to be someone in the comments who sounds off because if you bring up Lilith, you bring up a whole can of forms. So that aside, beyond Lilith, another one that comes up is Babylon. So Babylon is a spirit that obviously you see her in Revelations, but she's really central in Thelema. In Thelema, Babylon is the gateway to the abyss, right? And interestingly enough, another Thelemic spirit called Nuit, which is the central goddess of Thelema, she is the night sky. She, if you look at Egyptian mythology, is Nuit as well, though it's spelled a little differently, probably like to change the spelling of things. And Nuit is the endless, you know, endless, right? She's endless, she's the sky. She is partnered with Hadith, which is the central masculine entity of Thelema. And together they create Ra Horquit, which is the new Aeon, the crown and conquering child, right? But... The interesting thing is Babylon and Nuit are actually aspects of each other, which is something that a lot of Islamic texts don't bring up immediately, but they actually are. Um, they are different levels to each other. And so that I think really plays into this divine feminine versus dark divine feminine theory, because Nuit is this very, you know, she's veiled, she's voluptuous, she's, you know, she's blue, she's the night sky, and she is, you know, I am the blue lidded daughter of sunset. Whereas when you look at Babylon in Thelemic lore, specifically if we're going to look at Liber 49, which is controversially called the fourth chapter of the Book of Law, I don't think it is. Jack Parsons certainly thought it was. Uh, Babylon is fiery. She's apocalyptic. 
she's much more aggressively central. She's very, this very dominant femininity, which Manon Hindenburg White wrote about in her book, The Eloquent Blood. So these two, they're very different femininities, but they are aspecting each other. And so in a sense, I could say Babylon is the dark divine feminine and represents that aspect. As well, another instance of this outside of Philema would be across Europe with war goddesses. So war would be something we would intuitively want to assign to the masculine because it is strength, it is fire, it is bloodshed. But there are numerous female goddesses of war. Freya, for instance, represents love and war. Um, as well, we have Athena, who is sort of like battle analysis and strategy. As well, we actually have Inanna Ishtar, which is a Sumerian deity that represents both love and war in different aspects. And so a through line with these, excluding Athena, who is more military strategy, that love and war are connected. And that's really interesting to me because love and war, even on the planetary level, are connected in a specific way. Like, let's look at Mars. Mars represents sex, but also war. And so you get entities like Freya and Inan Ishtar that represent both, showing that there is a connection between these two emotions, right? There is some connection somewhere between love, war, hate, love. These strong emotions are connected. They're on some sort of continuum. They are not dichotomous, which that's sort of a recurring theme in mythology because in the end, Let's be real, the end of Western esotericism is the idea that there is no separation, right? And that's why I think it goes back to monism. But that's another conversation. I'm just saying, it does go back to monism. Regardless, I mean, yeah, there's this connection, love and war, they are not opposites. Hello, I'm here to interrupt your regularly scheduled programming. I guess we could call this an intermission. Is it pretentious to call the middle of a YouTube video an intermission? Because I actually have a brand that has partnered to make this video possible. I did open the box because my address is on this part and I'm not doxing myself for y'all. I love y'all, but not that much. This is from Goddess Provisions. They're adorable. This flap says, you are so loved. Together we shine. I was sent their monthly box. Goddess Provisions is a spirituality subscription box that every month picks a theme and sends people little goodies based around that theme. So this box is adorable and it's got a lot of really cute stuff. First, it actually has an entire book in it. Your intuition led you here. Daily rituals for empowerment, interknowing and magic. And it's really cute. They've got instructions on how to do things. They've got personal touches and they've got whole rituals. It's really cool. So if you wanna get into intuitive stuff, this book is quite cool. They also, um, you know, they have like all subscription boxes, like an explanation of everything that's in here with these little pamphlets, um, all the things. There was a loose leaf tea. I have not tasted it yet, but I will tonight by Snowy Owl Tea, ultraviolet. It's green tea with violet and lemongrass, which sounds like really good. Um, all these correspondences I think would work really well together with the intuitive vibe. So I'm, I'm here for it. There is a keychain with the back. It says, I can unlock my desired reality. Super, super cute. As well, there is aura, hair, and face oil so that, you know, even your hair and your face can be filled with a good aura. And then there is this little crystal and this cute little, they called it a sun catcher, which... I have something similar that's like a moon version on my wall. It's even got a little Ouroboros. Oh, it's so cute. So thank you so, so much to Goddess Provisions for sending me this box and making this video possible. Check them out. I'll link all their stuff down below so you can grab your own. All right, now back to the video. Let's talk about the Dark Divine Feminine. And you know, you can really connect to the Dark Divine Feminine with this, this little box. The next thing I wanted to discuss in this video is, is there any point to connecting to the dark divine feminine? Obviously it is the darker side. It is that anger, that war, that defensiveness of your children. The ability, even on the physical level of women, when they're going through birth, through labor, they experience a lot of pain and a lot of this primal suffering to bring forth the child, right? It is that, it is that connection between softness, femininity, and screaming. There is a connection there. Femininity is powerful. It is a tour de force. 
and it has many aspects to it. Much like how when you look at water, water can be pretty and still, but if you step into the still water, there might be rapids that take you away. Femininity has many faces and is very complex. Femininity is spiritual, it is powerful, it's got serious weight to it. I think there is value to connecting to it. Obviously, since it is a stronger, more intense and more chthonic energy, it should be done in moderation. But I think a lot of women could actually benefit from this. One of the things that I notice in women is that women are sometimes scared of embodying that sort of Valkyrie that is within them, right? There is a strength within us. And I think that the dark divine feminine can give us a pathway to it. So how do you do it? How do I connect to the dark divine feminine? That's sort of the final question and probably why some people have clicked on this video. So obviously you can do things like mantras. You could get a set of mala beads and repeat a mantra that relates to the concept of the dark divine feminine. You could work with specific goddesses like Hecate. You could work with Babylon. You could work with Inanna Ishtar, who I also think would fit in this category. You could, you know, call up those spirits and be like, hey, let's form a relationship. You could even become a devotee, go really hard, make one your matron, right? You could take that really extremely. Or, you know, you could try, you know, connecting to these archetypes, being like, okay, when I connect to my femininity, let's also remember the lioness, right? Let's remember the value of protecting my family and protecting my passions and protecting, you know, everything I represent, my culture, etc. right? That could be connected to the dark divine feminine. And yeah, pretty much any way you would connect to the regular feminine would apply here. I, there's not a huge, huge difference in that regard. And of course, working with archetypes, if you are someone who has a more secular or union view of things, I mean, you totally could do an archetypal thing. There are many ways to connect to archetypes, many ways to embody that, to work with that, and so on. Or if you're a Christian or something like that, because there are some Christians who do, do watch me. Shout out to y'all. I respect y'all. I think you also are, you know, experiencing truth in your own way. You're also mystics. Mary Magdalene would be a pretty good one for you guys because she is a saint and she kind of connects to these things. Cause she's very complicated, right? She was, you know, in love with Jesus. Uh, she was the one who found all the things, but at the same time, you know, she had this sort of history. And so she's very nuanced and complicated and she was able to use her virtue and her love to overcome a lot of things. So I think she would also fit in this category. So yeah, there's a lot to look into, a lot to research, and many things that I couldn't cover. But my final sort of thesis of this is that the dark divine feminine may look like something these like new age TikTok femininity coach girlies are on about, but I think it's got some serious weight to it and I think they're not entirely wrong. So I normally shit on the new age, but I'm gonna give the new age some points here. This has some basis and I think this is worth looking into. So. Thank you all for watching. Like, comment, subscribe, and ring the bell, and you'll find your holy guardian angel in 93 days, and you will not need to know anything about the Dark Divine Feminine. And if you want to support me and enable me to keep making videos, check out my Patreon or my Ko-Fi. You can donate directly through Ko-Fi or with Patreon. You can subscribe, and you get all these videos a week or more, sometimes more, ahead. You get extra videos every month. You get ritual guides, which my ritual guides have been breaking over 20 pages recently. They're getting really, really long. I've been pouring my entire heart into them. I'm really proud of them recently, so you can read those, and those have direct instruction on how to do things. If you're on high enough tier, you can meet with me once a month, and we can go over your personal spiritual practice, and I can give my sort of advice based on my own experiences. As well, I host the podcast, The Postmodern Iconoclast, which is a cultural and philosophic commentary podcast. It's on this channel, but it's also on podcasting platforms everywhere but Apple Podcasts, because Apple Podcasts and I don't tend to agree with each other. And you can also find me on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, Telegram, Odyssey, and Substack. I'm also a Substack blogger. So yeah, have a nice day wherever it is, wherever you are, and bye.